Hello, and welcome to Part 7 of the Star Citizen Beginner's Guide. In this video, you will be learning all about the character you play within the Star Citizen universe. And the way I will be organizing this video is I will start out by discussing how you make your character and then go through the overall uh, life cycle of the character and then go over how your character will age, get worn out, and eventually die. Now, the specific details on character creation are still extremely vague right now because CIG has not disclosed that much information. For example, on how characters can be customized as far as how they look. So what I'm about to tell you right here is a very, very generalized outline of the creation process. So when you first start out, you will be facing two doors. One of them will say male, the other one will say female. Yes, guys, that's right. There will be female characters in the game. So at this point, you have to choose what gender of character you wish to play. So you will go through one of these doors, and that would fix whether you will be a male or a female character. Once you're inside that room, there is going to be some kind of character customization screen that you interact with. And again, this is extremely vague, I'm afraid. I'm sorry about that, but the information simply is not available. But there'll be some kind of a customization screen where you can customize your facial features, your eye color, hair color, maybe, you know, the shape of your nose, shape of the mouth, uh, you know, the overall general look of what the character is going to be. Now, there are some rumors flying around that you will be able to make your character look like you. And the way this would work is you have a webcam on your computer that you point at your face. And I would imagine it would take several images of your face, maybe at different angles that you pose for. And then some really technical piece of software uses that information to build a face on your Star Citizen character that looks pretty much exactly like you. But again, this is just a rumor, so, you know, it sounds really cool, but we don't know if, if it's actually going to happen. But we do know that you'll be able to customize the overall look of your character, you know, in the eyes, the mouth, the nose, hairstyle, hair color, and so on. Uh, there are going to be some restrictions on that. You won't be able to make your character look like something that's really unrealistic or maybe something that's really grotesque, I would imagine. So, you know, you just have to use common sense and reason when you make your, your character. Now, after you finish making your character, you walk back out of that room and you find yourself in a sort of uh, recruitment office for the uh, United Empire of Earth Marines. And at this point... Uh, you would sign some forms, you would fill out who you want to be your next of kin, so when and if you do die, you want to designate who gets all your stuff, all your ships, your hangers, all the wealth, all your assets, and so on af after you die. After all that is taken care of, you have a choice. You can either join the Marines in Squadron 42 which I'll explain next, or you can just go into the Star Citizen universe as a civilian and start out your life that way. So what is Squadron 42? Well, in Squadron 42, you play a fresh Marine serving in the United Empire of Earth military. And Squadron 42 is going to be released as a standalone game. So it's separate from... Star Citizen. Okay, It is not the Star Citizen game, but it is indirectly related to it, and you'll see why in just a second. If you have ever played the old Chris Roberts game called Wing Commander, 
then you'll be right at home with uh, Squadron 42 because it's going to be pretty much along that same line of game, but it's going to be extraordinarily more advanced. So in Squadron 42, this is where you learn how to play the Star Citizen game. It's where you learn the lore, the history of the Star Citizen universe that spans around 930 years in the future. And I think the reason why they're doing that is to create a sense of personal immersion within the Star Citizen universe. And uh, I think that's going to be really, really cool. You will also learn your spaceship flight controls. Uh, you'll be engaging in space battles, boarding space stations, fighting nasty aliens, and so on. Now, the thing about this game is, unlike Star Citizen, which is an online game only, you can play Squadron 42 offline. So you don't have to worry about having a uh, high-speed internet connection to play Squadron 42. So, other than learning the history of the Star Citizen universe, learning how to play the game, how to control your ship, how to engage in space battles. Something else to consider about Squadron 42 is that it is a very common route to becoming a citizen within the Star Citizen universe. Now, what is the difference between a citizen and a civilian, you may ask? Well, we're going to be discussing that right now. So let's start with life as a civilian. The main thing to keep in mind is that civilians are the lowest class of people within the United Empire of Earth. Now, that isn't quite as bad as it sounds. I mean, it's not like you're a slave or you're a subjugated part of the population within the empire. So as an example, there is no such thing as a caste system within the Star Citizen universe where the people of a uh, society are stratified in a certain strict categories, and there are certain roles that those categories must play within society. So, for example, you can start out with Star Citizen, not join in, in with Squadron 42, going directly to the civilian route, becoming a lawless pirate, and then later on you decide you want to clean up your act, and then you can join in with Squadron 42, become a law-abiding citizen, start your own uh, multi-planetary corporation, and move on upwards from there. So once you choose a particular role within Star Citizen, you're not stuck at that role for the entire game. You can move up within society or you can move down within society, depending on the decisions that you make. Well, it Seems like I went off on a little bit of a tangent there. So let's get back to talking about what civilian life is all about. If you're a civilian, you're not going to be treated like you're the scum of the earth. You're not going to be stepped upon. It's just that in the hierarchy of the United Empire of Earth, civilians are at the lowest end. Also, for the most part, you're not going to be restricted as to your choice of occupation simply because you decided to stay a civilian. So, for example, you can be a space trucker and transport cargo from one planetary system to the next. However, keep in mind that you may not get as good a deal in your trade negotiations if you're a civilian than if you're a citizen. Being a citizen might mean that you make a larger profit than the same person doing the same job as a civilian. Now, there are some advantages to remaining a civilian. For example, let's say the occupation you have chosen to uh, pursue requires that you operate on the, uh, let's say, the other side of the law, if you know what I mean. Well, if you're a civilian, you're not under the watchful eye of the United Empire of Earth, at least not as much as if you were a citizen. The idea here being that you're sort of existing off the grid, so to speak. So you're in a position where you're not living under the laws of the United Empire of Earth. You're existing on the uh, sort of the edge of civilized space. And the prime example of an occupation that would fit this lifestyle would be, of course, a pirate. Now, it hasn't really been decided yet, 
if players will be able to hold any sort of political office to any degree. But in the history of the Star Citizen universe, it is known that the highest political rank a civilian can achieve is to be a governor on a planet. And that is far as they can go. They can't be senators, congressmen, anything of that higher rank. Your life as a citizen, on the other hand, is very different. The first thing you need to realize is that becoming a citizen is not going to be easy for you. It's not meant to be. The United Empire of Earth wants you to earn your citizenship. However, there are many, many benefits to being a citizen. For example, if you own a corporation, you are allowed to own multi-system corporations. So you won't be isolated to just one star system where your corporation can exist. It can exist between multiple star systems. Citizens can pursue political office. And again, like I mentioned before, it's not for certain that this will actually be in the game, at least not at the start, but in the star citizen lore, it is the citizens who are able to pursue um, higher political office. Citizens can also vote in elections for senators, referendums, at local elections, and so on. And citizens can also work directly with the UEE government. And I'm assuming that's more along the lines of contract work that you would do as a freelance agent. Now, if you're interested in trade, and in particular, if you're interested in trading with the uh, Xi'an or the Banu alien races, it is much easier to obtain a trade license to buy and sell with those races if you are a citizen. So that's something to keep in mind. Some additional benefits to being a citizen are that citizens pay a slightly lower tax rate. It's not yet known what percentage lower the tax rate will be, but it is known that it will be lower than if you were a civilian. Citizens are also given priority over civilians in situations where, say, you need to be rescued because you're stranded out in space somewhere. So, for example, if you're stranded in a sector of space and there is a civilian in their ship that's right near you and they're also stranded, when both of you send out a distress call to get help, when the rescue ship arrives in your area, that rescue ship is going to come to the citizen first and help out the civilian perhaps later. Citizens are also the so-called chosen members of society. And I'm inferring what that means is that because citizens have shown that they desire to advance the goals of the United Empire of Earth, that the United Empire of Earth government let's say, uh, smiles on them very nicely. And hence, they are the chosen members of society. Now, as I mentioned before, you become a citizen by joining up as a Marine within Squadron 42 and going through all the different uh, missions in Squadron 42. And then you come out and you can choose to become a citizen at that point. However, that is not the only way you can become a citizen. You can also choose not to go through Squadron 42 and see if you can become a citizen by engaging in community service or by application. And I'm assuming what application means is basically buying your way into becoming a citizen. Another practical advantage to being a citizen is that law enforcement might let you uh, slide on some minor crimes that you commit. Whereas if you are a civilian, you may be going off to jail for the same crime. Speaking of crime, if you're a convicted criminal in the sources in the universe, you will never be allowed to become a citizen. So now I would like to talk a little bit about what you're going to do once you get out there into the universe. Because whether you decide to go the route of Squadron 42 to become a citizen or just go directly to being a civilian. Either way, you're going to end up in the Star Citizen universe. Now, there are quite a few occupations you can pursue within the Star Citizen universe. 
And here is a list of just a few of them. Now, the thing about the occupation that you choose to pursue in Star Citizen is you can choose to become as immersed in that occupation as you wish. For example, let's say you want to be involved in mining operations for minerals. Well, if you like, you can choose to be involved in every stage of operations involving the mining of minerals and the selling of those minerals. So, for example, you can mine the minerals among some asteroid belt somewhere. Then you can refine those minerals yourself into a sellable product. Then you can transport those minerals to various planets and other locations that need those products. And finally, you can sell them at factories at those particular locations for a nice, handsome profit. So in this example, you're involved in the entire operation, the entire spectrum of the mining occupation. But you don't have to be. For example, you can just mine the minerals and sell them to a nearby refinery, and that's it. You're over and done with it. You just repeat that same cycle over and over again. You just keep on mining the minerals and selling them to a nearby refinery, and that's all you do. All the other stages in the operations are handled by other people. Or if you want to, you can mine those minerals, refine them yourself, and then hire someone else to transport those minerals to where they might be needed. Or another variation would be to mine the minerals yourself, refine them yourself, transport them yourself to where they are needed, but then hire a middleman to sell them to various factories. The same sorts of flexibility applies to lots of other occupations as well. So let's say, for example, you wanted to be an arms smuggler. Well, the steps involved in that would be forming a contract with people that need weapons, buying those weapons, supposedly on the black market, transporting the weapons back to your client, and selling them to your clients for a nice fat profit. But again, similar to a mining operation, you could be involved in all four of these steps, or just one of the steps, or just the first step, or the last step, or maybe two of these steps. So as far as occupations you can pursue within the Star Citizen universe, you have a lot of flexibility on how you pursue a particular occupation. Now let's backtrack for a few minutes here and discuss how you get a character in the game in the first place. Well, it turns out that it's pretty easy to get a character for Star Citizen. All you need to do is get yourself a ship package. Now, it's important to make a distinction here. You can buy a ship package, or you can buy a standalone ship. Here, for example, is a ship package for the 315P. And as you can see, it contains the ship, four months of insurance, the Star Citizen manual, beta access, the self-land hangar, the soundtrack for the game, when it's released, of course. Squadron 42, again, when it's released. Uh, starting credits of 2000 UEC, a digital star map, and the actual Star Citizen game, again, when it's released. So, it contains lots of really cool stuff. But the important thing, at least for this discussion, is that every ship package contains one character. And you won't find them listed in all the items that you get with the ship package, as you can see here. But trust me, the character is in the package. And this is only one of many, many game packages you can get at all sorts of price ranges and all sorts of options. Now, what's really cool about these characters that come with your ship package is that you can retain each character as one that you can play, or you can convert that character into a NPC character that can work with you in the Star Citizen universe. Now, why is that important? Well, let's say you're interested in exploration, but you're also interested in being an arms smuggler as well. 
Well, if you buy two ship packages, one can be used for exploration and the other one can be used for being an arms smuggler. And what you do is you just switch back and forth between those roles as the mood suits you while you're playing the game. Now, the other route you can take is, let's say you want to be an information runner, but you need a co-pilot. Well, you can convert one of your characters from a ship package into an NPC character, and then you can designate that that NPC is going to be your co-pilot for that particular occupation. So again, there's lots of flexibility here as far as how you assign each character that you own. Now let's talk a little bit about your character in more specific terms. Each character in Star Citizen is going to be made up of 100,000 polygons, which is about 10 times the usual number for characters generated in 3D graphics for games. What this means is the level of detail on a character will be phenomenal. In a previous video of this beginner's guide, I showed you a close-up shot of a character's face, and you could see the individual pores on the person's face. It was just amazing. So the level of detail for your character will be phenomenal. Something else that's really cool about your character is that your character is not static throughout the entire game. Your character is going to form scars over time and wounds over time as they engage in space battles and they get hurt and so on. They will age. They will get older over time and your character will eventually die. Now, one thing that's going to be really cool about your character is as you get hurt and damaged and you perhaps lose an arm or you, or you lose a leg, you will be able to get cybernetic replacements for your lost limbs. There will also be loads of clothing options for you, and there will be lots of different varieties of, of armor that you can buy. And because there will be so many options for clothing, what this will allow you to do, at least to a certain extent, is to really establish the personality of your character. I think that's going to be some really cool stuff. Now, if you're thinking of living the life of a career criminal in Star Citizen, you should know that for a price, you will be able to get plastic surgery done to change the way you look, and you can also pay various uh, nefarious characters to change your actual identity. So in this way, you can pretty much become an entirely different person within the game, if you have to uh, escape from the law, that is. Now, one thing that's sort of in the rumor mill of Star Citizen is that there may be the ability to have your live facial expressions appear on the character of your face. Now, and I know I spoke a little while ago about having a webcam and some software such that you can make your character look like you. But this is different. This is actually having your own facial expressions as you're in front of your computer monitor show up on the character in the game itself. Now, this sounds <laughs> like it sounds like science fiction stuff. And it is. But it would be really amazing if CIG could pull that off. Now let's look at how your character will eventually become damaged to the point where, well, your character dies. It's going to happen eventually. As a way of comparison, I want to look at how death takes place in Minecraft. Because Minecraft is a really popular game, so I would imagine a lot of you viewing this video are going to be familiar with Minecraft. So let's say you have an encounter with a skeleton and he's shooting you full of arrows and you're taking various hit points. Well, in Minecraft, you have a certain amount of hit points that you have available, modified by the type of armor you have and various enchantments. And depending on the kind of damage you're taking, the hearts on your little status bar there will 
go down, down, and lower and lower until they run out, and then you die. But what happens is you respawn at the last place that you set as your spawn point. So you're not really losing much of anything. I mean, if you're lucky, you can run back to the place where you died and you can pick up all the all your armor and weapons and stuff that were dropped when you died. But you know, that's a that's a fairly common thing to happen. So you're not really losing that much except for some experience points. Well, in Star Citizen, damage states are handled a lot differently and a lot more realistically. So let's use this character as an example. Each character in Star Citizen has 10 zones of damage on their body. And these are your head, your torso, your left and right upper arms, your left and right lower arms, the left and right upper legs, and the left and right lower legs. Now, on top of all those damage zones on your character, there are four stages of damage that each of those zones can have. And they go something like this. A green indicator tells you that you may have a few aches and pains in that part of your body, but you're basically ready to get out there and fight. Blue indicates you're hurt, and you'll have problems aiming your weapons, walking around, basic motor control, but you're still generally able to fight. Yellow indicates damaged health. That means that your pain is so severe, the damage is so bad, that it's going to be difficult for you to be mobile and difficult for you to use your weapons. Red indicates totally ruined part of your body. Uh, your limbs are totally useless and you are at risk of dying at this point. Now these colors, green, blue, yellow, and red, I don't think those are set in stone as far as being the actual colors that will indicate those damaged states. Oh, and by the way, in case you're wondering, you will be able to monitor the health of your body because you'll be getting, I guess we can call biometric feedback through the um, heads-up display on your helmet and or the Moby class display on your arm. So you will have sensors throughout your body armor or your suit that monitors the health of each of those zones on your body and then displays that information on your helmet or on your Moby glass display. Now, there are a few handheld medical devices you can use to heal yourself to a certain extent, but uh, these are somewhat limited. If you're really hurt very badly, you may find yourself in a Cutlass Red, otherwise known as the Space Ambulance, being um, patched up or perhaps being hurried off to a uh, hospital ship. Now, if you do end up in a hospital of some sort, there are generally four outcomes you can have. You can get yourself totally healed, partially healed. You can get some sort of a cybernetic implant, or you may die there. Now, I wanted to devote some time to discussing the idea that eventually your character is going to die. Because I think there's a lot of confusion about this topic. Apparently, some people think that when your character dies, that you have to start the game all over again. Well, you don't. And here I'm going to explain how this process takes place. So let's say this green character is the current version of you. Okay, So you go through all your adventures in the Star Citizen universe, and eventually you die. Now, if you recall at the beginning of this video, we were talking about when you finish creating your character, you come out of there into an office and you fill out paperwork and you designate who your next of kin is going to be. Well, the reason for that is when you die, all your assets get passed on 
to whoever you indicate on that paperwork. So after you die, your next of kin will inherit your estate, so to speak. Now, I would imagine that this person that is replacing you would have to also designate a next of kin for when that character dies. And this process goes on one generation after the next after the next. So what happens here is you develop a sense of legacy or family history within the Star Citizen universe, which is sort of like a little segment of the overarching history of the entire Star Citizen universe. So again, this process helps to nurture a sense of immersion within the game. So whatever current character you are playing would have, for example, bragging rights if that character's great-grandfather was a founder of a colony on a newly discovered world. So as far as the actual odds of your character dying in any particular circumstance, uh, Chris Roberts has mentioned that it's actually not going to be easy to die. And the reason for that is that medical technology, 930 years from now, has advanced so far that what we today consider to be a dead person, 930 years from now, would not be considered totally dead. Let's put it that way. Just as 200 years ago, the medical profession thought that when a person's heartbeat stopped and when they stopped breathing, it was assumed that that person was dead. Well, we know now that's not true. So 930 years from now, from our perspective today, the people in the future will be able to bring the dead back to life, so to speak. That is from our point of view. One other point to keep in mind is that there will be a limit on the number of quote-unquote, death events your character will be able to go through before they finally kick the bucket. And Chris Roberts has stated that you will be able to have roughly five or six times in your character's life when you're hurt so badly that you're sort of dead, (laughs) if you put it that way, and then they bring you back to life. So that can happen to you five or six times before your body just gives out and is too worn out to carry on any further, and you just die, and that's it. That's permadeath for that particular character. Now, once your character is dead, that character is not necessarily forgotten. If your character has had some notable achievements, they will be noted in the Star Citizen Galactopedia, which is like... Oh, (laughs) to put loosely, it's sort of a Wikipedia of the Star Citizen universe that is constantly going to be updated as the Star Citizen game moves forward. So there will be a entry for any of your ancestors that have become famous for some reason. Also, on their gravestone, for example, something like this one right here, you will have your notable achievements carved into the stone, for example, like this. And one thing that I thought would be really cool, but hasn't been mentioned yet, is if you were in the UEE Marine Corps or uh, the member of an organization, I was thinking it would be really cool to have the logo for the Marine Corps or or for the organization that you belong to carved into the gravestone of your ancestor. That would be a pretty cool thing to see. And so there you have it. All the basic information you need to know about your character in Star Citizen. And for those of you who are curious to know, there are going to be three more videos in this Beginner's Guide series for a total of 10 videos. So there's still quite a bit more information for you guys to learn. If you have anything you want to say about this video, please feel free to leave me a comment. I am very active in the comments section, and I respond to pretty much everybody who sends me a message or asks me a question. 
And of course, if you really want to show support for Citizen Academy, please press on the little subscribe button down below there. Until next time, this is Citizen Academy, wishing all of you fame and fortune in the verse.